Hello, welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study at Oxford Bible Church. I'm Derek Walker, and we are in our series on the Gospel of Mark, and we're moving quite quickly through the Gospel of Mark, and we are now in chapter 6. Mark is an action-packed gospel, so uh, it probably is fitting to do it at some speed. So we're kind of doing half a chapter a time, because each chapter is quite long, that's really as best we can do it. So today we are going to read really a combination of about three stories, and but they, they seem to have this common theme of as, as we preach the gospel, as we declare God's word, as we are his ambassadors, it, there is resistance, there is opposition. And so part of this is training for how do we deal with that? How do we overcome opposition as we do God's word and work and speak God's word? Uh, let's start with a word of prayer and then we'll go to our reading. Lord, we thank you for every passage of scripture. It, you have you put it there to teach us, to equip us. Thank you, Lord, for bringing this passage of scripture to life for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's read our passage. It's actually, um, we're going to read uh, Mark 6 from verse 1, and we're going to go to verse 30. Okay. <clears throat> then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now, he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit, teaching. And he called the twelve to himself, and began to send them out two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals, and not to put on two tunics. Also he said to them, In whatever place you enter a house, stay there until you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you, nor hear you, then when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more to tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than, than for that city. So they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Now... King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, It is Elijah. And others said, It is the prophet, or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, This is John, whom I beheaded. He's been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things, and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias, um, when Herodias's daughter herself came in, 
and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately he ca she came in with haste to the king and said, and, and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. And when the disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Okay, very interesting passage of scripture there, and um, praise God. We get, let's go to the beginning and uh, pick up the story from verse 1. We saw in the previous chapter that Jesus, this is during the time, really, of Jesus' uh, as it were, big ministry. He's having a lot of big crowds follow him in Galilee. This is known as his Galilean ministry, his public ministry in Galilee, with lots of crowds following him. We saw last time him healing the issue, the woman with the issue of blood, and then raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. And then in verse 6, it says, Then, uh, at that time, he went out from there, um, which was the region around Galilee, and came to his own country. Now, his own country, of course, was Nazareth, the, the region of Nazareth where he grew up, you know, which is probably like, um, I don't know, a day's walk up into the higher ground around Galilee. Um, and so he goes to his own country, and his disciples followed him. So part of this is he is training his disciples for his coming ministry. Now, this was very courageous of Jesus because we are uh, uh, the, we are at, um, when you go to Luke four, we see that Jesus went to Nazareth beforehand. Now that was near the start of his ministry. Uh, in fact, if we go into the Gospels, we find that Jesus did a lot of early ministry, which is only recorded in the Gospel of John, for kind of like for the first year. Um, and he was uh, ministering mostly in Judea, often alongside John the Baptist. And then the key moment is, and, and this comes into our passage today, John the Baptist was arrested and put in prison. And he was put in prison by Herod Antipas. Um, it can be very confusing with the, with the Herods because there's quite a few of them. All right, the famous one, the most famous one, is Herod the Great, and he was the king of the, all of Israel at the time of Jesus' birth. If you remember, it was Herod the Great who actually slaughtered the innocents, trying to trying to kill Jesus. I believe Herod the the Great died in one B.C. And uh, soon after his attempt to destroy, uh, to kill Jesus. Uh, and then when he died, he was replaced. His kingdom was split between various sons. Um, and one of those sons is Herod Antipas. Okay, and he was um, called a tetrarch, which means he had one quarter of Herod the Great's territory. And Herod Antipas, in fact, we'll, we'll look at a map right now um, that shows how Israel w was split up. Um, in this uh, picture, we have, um, you'll notice the purple territory um, there is the territory of Herod Antipas. And if you remember later on in the Gospels, Jesus described him like a fox. Um, 
and it's Herod Antipas who had the control of Galilee in purple, and he also had control of another area to the south and to the east called Perea, and that's where that's described in purple as well, and that is his the other part of his territory. In fact, um, that part is on the east side of the Dead Sea. Now, where John the Baptist was locked up, we actually know from Josephus. Josephus tells us that he was locked up in a mountain uh, kind of fortress palace called Macarus. And Macarus is at the southern end, right by the Dead Sea, on the east side. Uh, and that, that fortress called Macarus um, is where John the Baptist was imprisoned and eventually executed. Okay, so those are the two regions of John's uh, of of Herod Antipas's territory. He was one of the sons of Herod the Great. Now another son is um, is ba you see the region called Batania. That was uh, Philip the Tetrarch was there. It was another relative of um, another son of Herod, and that's uh, Caesarea Philippi is in his region. And sometimes when Jesus would cross over Galilee, he would move from one Herod's territory into 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 Philip's territory, and th and that was often done for for safety, because Herod Antipas was a dangerous guy. Um, so we he comes into the picture as well. Um, you see other regions there. Half of the territory, really, down in the blue, was was originally given to. Archelaus, one of Herod the Great's sons, who was really bad, so he didn't last long. So that that's a bit of the geography there, and um, we will um, we will we'll talk more about that. Um, so Herod Antipas had his palace at Tiberias, and he also had his palace at Macarus. Okay. So let's um, let's let's. Uh, Let's go back now. Uh, I'm not sure why I went talking about that so quickly. Anyway, we will get... Oh, yes, we're talking about the fact, setting the scene of the Gospels. When John the Baptist was imprisoned, that was earlier on, then it says Jesus came in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And, that, and that's when, in John's Gospel, he went through Samaria and ministered to the Samaritan woman and reached out to the Samaritans there. But then when he arrived in Galilee, that is when his ministry really exploded. But the trigger point was John the Baptist's arrest. And then that he entered into his big Galilean ministry, which would have lasted at least a year and a half. And, and, uh, and, and so that's when John was arrested. What we're going to see is a new turning point that we're coming up to now, which is when John the Baptist is actually killed. And that's what is going to happen by the time of verse 30. And that, when Jesus hears about that, that's when he crosses over into to Bethsaida in Philip's territory. And that's when he feeds the 5,000. Okay, so we're, that, that kind of gives you a, a bit of an overview. All right. So going back to, to verse uh, 1, we talked about the disciples follow Jesus as he goes to Nazareth. That's what I was saying. All right, I remember now. When Jesus, in Luke 4, came in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, one of the first things he did was go to Nazareth. And if you remember, on that trip to Nazareth, they ended up trying to kill Jesus. All right, And he actually walked through the crowd. So it's very courageous now. In Mark 6, he goes back to Nazareth. This is like a year later. Uh, and he is still wanting to reach out and give them another chance, you see. And this tells us one thing, you know, when you face opposition, we, we just got to just stick with God's, you know, people. We, we don't take revenge against people. Uh, we... And we mustn't be thrown by the opposition. We we are ambassadors of Christ. We are on His mission. So our responsibility is to fulfil our mission, irrespective of, you know, the opposition. And so Jesus didn't let the past experience stop him reach out again 
to his own folk. All right, so he, this is the second trip to Nazareth that, we're talked to, that we know about. Verse 2, And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And so they, as a, as a visiting um, rabbi, they invited him to teach. And, uh, and many hearing him were astonished. You know, they astonished at his teaching. And they're saying, where did this man get these things? In other words, where did he get this, this knowledge, this teaching? He was obviously um, teaching tremendous stuff. Uh, and but they are questioning him, as we're going to see. They know him. They, he he grew up among them, and um, one of the problems is that familiarity breeds contempt. They 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 couldn't accept what he was saying because he's saying he's he's just a carpenter. He's he's you know where did he get this stuff from? And um, he was also giving, as it were, original teaching because the usual Jewish teachers were just parrot you know whatever their rabbi has told them but jesus was teaching with authority and they are saying you know where did he get this this knowledge from you know he, he hadn't gone to a bible school he he didn't learn it when growing up with us of course jesus got it straight from the father through through the scriptures but um they they are using that as a, an excuse for unbelief so where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him? So first of all, they, they are amazed at his wisdom. And that such mighty works are performed by his hands. So they know about the, all the miracles that have been done. Stories have been coming back to him about all the miracles that he's been doing in all the different places. And his great teachings you know and and so they were saying what's the origin of this and if you remember there is the accusation hanging over jesus by the spiritual leaders and, and all the people have to make up their mind who is right jesus who claims to speak from god or the spiritual leaders are actually accusing jesus of being possessed by the devil <laughs> you see and so they're asking that question where, where does he get it from? And maybe they're even thinking, well, the leaders are saying he gets it. it, it there's, he, he didn't get it from us. Maybe he got it from the devil. Maybe it's the devil that's giving him all this power. And, and so they, are, they, they don't know what to do with Jesus. They can't explain him. And often when people don't understand and can't explain you, they, they will tend to condemn you. And that's what's happening here. And then they say in verse 3, um, is this not the carpenter? Now, that's interesting. Uh, in the Matthew version, it says, isn't he the son of the carpenter? This word carpenter, by the way, is technon, and it does mean a worker in wood, but it can also mean a builder, a worker in stone and metal as well. So J Joseph, Jesus' father, was a carpenter. He was a builder. And uh, Jesus... Um, they would have had plenty of work uh, if he would just uh, and then in those days the father just apprenticed the son in whatever he did and so here Jesus is called a carpenter he worked until he was age 30 he worked in the family business and he worked in wood so he would have certainly have, have built you know farm instruments he would have repaired boats he would have um done windows of houses and doors and all kinds of things but also he might have been a builder because just a, a few miles away in Sephoris Sephoris had been destroyed um, and during Jesus's childhood Sephoris would have been built rebuilt as a regional capital and it's quite likely that Joseph and then later Jesus his son would have gone every day to Sephorist to, to do building work there. So they would have had good work. And, and by the way, although in the Greek community, uh, working with your hands was frowned upon. You know, it's very low level. But in the Jewish world, it was very honored and very respected. You know, if you were a builder, 
or a carpenter. That that was, you know, sure, you weren't one of the aristocrats, uh, but neither were you kind of on the low level. You you were in a very respectable uh, trade there. So Jesus was a carpenter. So he says he's just a carpenter. We've seen him do the daily work day by day. Uh, so why is he now suddenly claiming to be this this great man of God and doing miracles and giving all these teachings? What Bible school did he go to? We, he didn't learn it from his dad or, or the people around us. You know, he didn't have any special education. They just, they just can't explain Jesus. Notice also they call him, verse 3, the son of Mary. Now this is interesting. This first of all indicates that his father Joseph, you know, his legal father Joseph had died by now. All right? Cuz but also even then calling him the son of Moses was a bit of an insult because normally you would actually name somebody after the father. It'd be the son of Joseph, but they don't say that. And it's an insinuation, it confirms the virgin birth because it's an insinuation that there was something improper in his birth, that he's maybe he's not really the son of, you know, Joseph. He's the son of Mary, all right? Uh, and so there would have been these accusations that maybe Mary was, was unfaithful or something like that. But it, it actually supports the idea of the virgin birth. They, and they're, but they're using this in a cute, uh, accusatory way that um, Joseph wasn't really the father, which is true, but they would have um, probably used that in a negative way, that there was something wrong with his birth. So he's the son of Mary. Who does he think he is? And he's the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. So here we find that Mary had four other um, sons after Jesus. What the first one, James, is the very brother of Jesus who wrote the book of James. In the, in the Hebrew, it's really the word Jacob. Joseph is actually short for, jo for Joseph, Joseph. Judas is the man who wrote the book of Jude, the letter of Jude in the Bible. He calls himself the brother of James and Simon. And then he says, are not his sisters here with us? So, Jesus also had at least two sisters. They're not given names. Uh, and so here we see that in Jesus' family, there was at least seven, seven children. All right, Jesus being the oldest. And um, now, of course, the Roman Catholic teaching denies the fact that these are actually brothers, you know, children of Joseph and Mary, because they believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary. In other words, to keep Mary pure, and obviously seeing sex as something impure, um, they, some pope or somebody came up with this idea that Mary didn't have sex again and didn't have any more children. She was a perpetual virgin. Which means they, these ones named here, they must be cousins or children of Joseph from a previous marriage. Well, there's no evidence for that. And actually, there is a word in the Greek that describes cousin, or something like that, that could have been used. And it isn't. This is the word used, normally used for brothers and sisters. And and so, notice it says that the, the sisters um, are actually living still in Nazareth. So... Here we have a glimpse into Jesus' natural family here. At this point, they weren't really believing in him. But, but later on, they do, certainly after the resurrection. And in fact, they become quite well uh, important part of the early church. Um, I should mention, by the way, that Nazareth is um, uh, named after uh, Isaiah 11. Um, verse 1. Let me quickly go there. Isaiah 11, verse 1. When the uh, Jews were deported to Babylon, uh, after a time they begin to come back. And one of the places, and they settled in different places. Now the, the house of David, the, the, the royal family as it were, were now very poor. 
And they actually resettled in certain villages, and one of them was Nazareth. And there's a prophecy in Isaiah 11 about the future Messiah, and it says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. Now, Jesse was David's father, so he's saying, out of the David's out of the royal family, it says a branch will grow out of his roots. This branch is a title for the Messiah. And the word branch is Netzer. And that's where you get Nazarene. In other words, Nazareth means the village of the branch. So this, this part of the royal family, when they settled back in Galilee, when they come back from, Gal from Babylon, they actually... They, and they kept all the genealogical records. Um, they kept their royal identity, even though they were poor, and they named their village Nazareth to mark the fact that they were the community of the branch. And now the branch is springing up among them, and they don't recognize that it's him, you see. and uh, And so... It says that they were offended at him. They were offended at him because he was making all these claims for himself, really, that he was the Messiah, that he was a prophet of God. And, and you know, this is one reason why there is opposition persecution, because we are making great claims about this man called Jesus, who, who in one sense had a very ordinary upbringing. You know, he was a carpenter, he was a builder. And and we are claiming, and, and we are claiming that he is the Son of God. And, and it has to be revealed to you that this is true. And so unbelief re rejects that and resists that. What are you talking about, they say? Um, where, where did he get this, this wisdom from, this power from? He didn't go to the right Bible schools. He didn't, you know... Um, you know, he just seems an ordinary guy. And and so this is a picture of unbelief. Because they are offended at the claims, the unique claims we make about Jesus. And so they were offended at him. He's Who do you think you are making yourself something special? You're just one of us, come on. But Jesus said to them, verse 4, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives and in his own house. And this was a kind of an adaption of a well-known saying, really, and that you might summarize by familiarity breeds contempt. Now, that shouldn't happen. And somebody said, familiarity only breeds contempt if you're talking about something that is contemptible. Okay? And so when you get familiar with it, you you have contempt. Or if you are contemptible, because you don't value what is what is what is good but there is a truth that if you're not careful you can take for granted um things that are close to you you know your your friends your family and so on you you because you get used to being with them you forget um you you forget to honor them so he jesus is saying it's a case of that they don't recognize who he is and here he claims to be a prophet one who speaks forth the word of God. Being a prophet is not just foretelling the future. That's just one little aspect of it. A prophet forth tells. He speaks forth the word of God. And it says, uh, under the inspiration of God. And, uh, and, it, and it is true, isn't it? Often, a prophet is not recognized by those who are closest to him. Because, again familiarity can breed contempt so we've got to be careful of that ourselves all right and so basically he's saying they haven't they don't honor him they do not see his value they do not recognize his authority they dishonor him they're they're rejecting him when you don't honor god you are rejecting god when you don't honor jesus you're rejecting him and this is what's happening here and verse 5 says, the, the result of that is that he could do no mighty work there, no miracle there. And it's a strong language here. He says he could not, not that he would not, but he could not. 
Remember, he wasn't ministering as God. He was ministering as a man under the anointing of God. And it says he could do no mighty work there. Why? Because of their unbelief. In verse 6, it confirms that. He marveled because of their unbelief. You see? So if the key for the anointing, one key for the anointing, is that you honor God. And yes, you honor the, you know, if God is using someone, uh, God is speaking through someone, you honor the prophet, you honor the person. Because it's that honor that opens the door for God to move and do, do miracles. Praise God. Because they did not honor him, the anointing could not flow. He could not do any mighty works there, you see, because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. So unbelief shuts down the power of God. See, generally speaking, Jesus ministered under the anointing. So when they believed in the anointing, that anointing could flow and do miracles. Now, even if there was unbelief, Jesus could sometimes do miracles by the gifts of the Spirit. Because the gifts of the Spirit do not depend on the, the other people's faith. But on that occasion, God did not see fit to use the gifts of the Spirit, even though Jesus would have wanted that to happen. He would have wanted you know, those gifts to flow. But God saw fit that that was not suitable because they had this kind of hardened heart of unbelief. And God, generally speaking, he can do mighty miracles in those cases, but often, he normally, he will not because their unbelief, does it, as it were, blocks that. And so God was not going to move in the gifts of the Spirit. Neither could the anointing flow. The healing anointing couldn't flow because of their unbelief. So Jesus, because he was operating as a man under the anointing of the Spirit, he could not do. He wanted to, but he couldn't do any great miracles there. Sad. Except, but notice, except that, he did what he could. Notice, in the face of this unbelief and opposition, he still did what he could. You know, when sometimes when you preach, it's, it's like people are receptive, um, they honor the word of God, they honor the spirit of God, and it's easy. Other, other times you might pre preach in a place where it's very hard because there's so much unbelief, and even like Jesus faced, people are very suspicious of you and so on. And, and what should you do when you face that opposition? Well, you just do what you can. You preach the word the best you can, and, and you, you pray for people as much as you can. That's all you can do, all right? And so he says, he still except that he laid his hands on a few sickly people and healed them. The word sick, they weren't, there wasn't anything terribly wrong with these people, but, you know, these are people with a, with a bit of a cold or, or something. You know, it, it says they were sickly. They were sickly. So um, they didn't have a major illness, but they were sickly. So he was able to get some people healed, even under those conditions. People, you know, they come up with a bit of a cold, bit of a cough, you know, they, 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 they probably come up to Jesus and say, okay, I'm, I'm willing, uh, please pray for me. Uh, and so he, he healed them with the anointing of God. So he was even able to get some of them healed. All right. This also shows, by the way, that when you can't get people healed any other way, the laying on of hands, people will believe and receive their healing through the laying on of hands. And so he laid his hands on a few sickly people, just a handful, not many, um, and he healed them. Praise God. So even in this unbelief, he could bless a few people. So he didn't let that opposition cause him to turn against them. You know, he reached out to them as best he could. He, he was led by the lo love of God. But notice verse 6. He marveled because of their unbelief. And th there's an interesting thing here. This word marveled, which is to be absolutely dumbfounded, flabbergasted, I think is the best word, um, by their unbelief. He, this word is only used twice. And the, one case is when the, gen, the Gentile centurion believed Jesus. And he marveled at his faith. And here we have his very own people unbelie in unbelief, and he marvels at their unbelief. It's like a, a reversal. 
you don't expect the Gentiles to believe, and yet here's this centurion who believes, and Jesus marvels at that. And here, his own people who should believe, because God had prepared them for the coming of the Messiah, and yet they don't believe. They're stubborn, stubborn in their unbelief, and he marvels at their unbelief. He's, it's almost like he's taken by surprise that they would not believe in him, his very own people that he grew up with. All right. And then it says, this is how we, how do you respond to unbelief? What do you do? Hide in a corner? No. It says, then he went around the villages in a circuit teaching. So we went around that whole area, around Nazareth, in that part of Galilee. And his answer is, just to keep teaching the word of God. If there's unbelief, what do you do? Keep teaching the word. Keep teaching the word. When you face opposition, do you just hide away? No, you just keep teaching the word. You keep building their faith because faith comes through hearing the word of God. You just keep doing what God's called you to do. So we went around the villages teaching the word of God. Just don't be put off by opposition. Just keep doing what God's told you to do. Praise God. And then he, so that he is in this ministry tour, and now we go into the next story in verse 7. He called the twelve to himself. Now, previously, we've already seen in Mark, that he, I think it's in Mark 3, that he chose the twelve. He appointed the twelve, okay? But here now, he is starting something new. He is going to multiply his ministry, Praise God. And now, these 12, he calls to himself. You know, before God tells you to do anything, he first of all calls you to himself. He wants you to come close to him. When you're close to him, then you can hear what assignment he has for you. So, first of all, he calls you to himself. And then it says, he began to send them out two by two. So, there's 12 of them. So, now he puts them into pairs. And he sends them out two by two. So there's six lots of two. And, and they go out. And they uh, do what Jesus did. He's preaching, teaching, and delivering from demons. So now he is multiplying his ministry. Praise God. And it's interesting. If we go to, I think it's Matthew 10, we see one of the lists of these 12 disciples actually does it in pairs if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 2, it says, the parallel account, it says, um, well, let's read it from verse 1. Matthew 10, verse 1. Now, when he had called his 12 disciples to him, to himself, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sick, sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Notice, he throughout now, in the grammar, he does it, he, give, he pairs them off. And in this list, it, we're told, actually, which they, it says they went out two by two. This is the twos they went out in, all right? Peter went with Andrew, his brother. The next pair is James and John. They, they are also brothers. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. James and John. Then the next two, Philip and Bartholomew, verse 3. And then the next two was Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, then the next two, James and, and Lebius or Thaddeus. And then in verse 4, Simon and Simon the Canite and Judas Iscariot. So there we, we, we see which twos they went in. All right. So going back to Mark 6, it says, He called the twelve to himself and sent them out two by two. And, and there's, it makes sense. And one reason for for sending them out in twos is that in Deuteronomy and elsewhere it says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses everything shall be established so they are giving witness to Jesus and therefore it makes sense that there are two of them that give witness to give credibility to their witness and also of course they, they can encourage each other and help each other so that makes a lot of sense that going two by two and he gave them power over unclean spirits.
praise God. The word power there is really authority, exousia. They gave him authority. They had authority to cast out evil spirits. It, the authority Jesus had, he gave it to them for that mission. Verse 8. And now we see that this is actually train. He's training them and he's preparing them for when they're going to have to do this without him. Okay. And so because it's a training, he's actually giving them some restrictions. Verse 8. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff. Then they're not to take anything extra. All right. Partly because this is urgent and partly he, he's training them to trust in God for their provisions. And so he says, you take a, a staff, that's a walking staff, no bag, so no beggar's bag or any other kind of bag to, be, to, to collect money with, all right? No bread, they weren't to take any spare food, they weren't to take any copper or money in their money belts, can you imagine? They were told to wear sandals rather than fancy shoes. And not to put on two tunics. Now, this is actually two undergarments. They were just to have the one undergarment, and as well as their overgarment. And and that is, um, for instance, if it was cold at night, you would want a second undergarment if you were sleeping outside. But what he was saying is, I want you to trust in God to provide that that people as you go will give you hospitality. And it was causing them to trust in God. A bit like when Israel went out of Egypt in the wilderness, they had to learn how to trust God. And so he's, he's teaching them to trust in God and not to, to and, and so God will provide what they need through the hospitality to the places. It kind of meant that they, they couldn't, um, you know, stay in, in uh, hotels or or miss the mission. They they had to be totally committed to the mission. Uh, only that way would they get the hospitality and the food and everything they needed if they actually went ahead and did that mission. And then God would provide what they needed. So it was a real act of faith on their part. And he said to them in verse 10, In whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. So when if you find someone who will take you in and look after you, it's obviously somebody who is well disposed towards your, you and the message, then somebody else down the street says, "Oh, I've got a nicer place." You know, we, you, I see that you you are important people. Um, I want to put you up. You know, he says, "Don't do that. You stay in the house that originally put you up. Don't go looking around for better accommodation." All right, um, that would leave a bad impression, really. And then it says in verse eleven, we see again that they will not always be accepted. They there will be places where they are rejected by the by the people, and and he said he's getting them to get ready for this because this would continue after his death and resurrection. That sometimes when you preach the gospel, there's opposition, there's persecution, there's rejection. You've got to know how to handle that. Verse 11 says, And whoever will not receive you or hear you, what are you going to do? Okay, because you can, you can, if you're not careful, you can take that personally. You can take that rejection personally. You've got to realize, if they reject you, then they're rejecting Jesus, they're rejecting the gospel. They're not rejecting you personally. We're not to let it affect us, okay? And and this is what he's he's saying here. Don't take it personally. Just carry on with the mission. You see, don't let it deter you. Because he says, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. And interestingly, in the Jewish um, ways... Um, if a Jew went into Gentile territory, uh, which he would consider unclean, before he re-entered Jewish territory, he would shake off the dust of the Gentile territory off his feet, as it were, uh, because that, that is impure. So he, he shakes it off. And Jesus kind of uses this analogy. He's saying, if they reject you, they are 
you, what you've got to realize is don't take that personally like you've done something wrong. It is actually you are to make this this point really that they are under the judgment of God, that they are unclean, that they have rejected God, not just you. And therefore, he says, shake the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. In other words, you, you are saying to them, look, this is evidence against you that you've heard the gospel and yet you've rejected. That That is a testimony. And that's not to be nasty, but it's actually to, to help them to wake up to the reality that they're in a bad place with God because they have rejected that testimony. He says that is a testimony against them. You are, you are not cringing in rejection. You are actually being bold and you are being confident. And if somebody rejects the gospel, you're not to be intimidated by that. Rather, even, you, you are to say, look, I've, I've shared the gospel with you. Your blood is not on my hands. The responsibility is off, off me now. Your blood is on your own hands. Um, and, and really, that's to, to actually help them to wake up to, to the fact that things are not, not right. And your confidence will help bring them under conviction. In fact, they do this. Paul does this, I think it is, in Acts chapter 18. So what we must do if we are rejected, we, we, we must shake off any kind of condemnation or bad feeling that's, that, that somehow, you know, we're to blame. We're not to receive that from them. In, instead, we're to do the opposite. And we're to say, look, you, you, it's a warning against them that, of judgment. You know, sharing the gospel also has a negative side of, ju of warning against judgment. Yes, we give good news that there is salvation from sin, but we also tell them that God is just, and because you're a sinner... God must punish your sin. There is the warning of the of judgment and consequences if you reject the gospel is part of the message, you see. And by actually shaking off the dust, it's a final reminder saying, you know, you because you've not responded, you are still in danger of the judgment of God. And the fact that we've we've um witness this to you will only increase your guilt if you don't repent in other words we're not to be cowed and intimidated by rejection but we are to be bold in the face of that and and that will help them realize that they're in the wrong that they shouldn't be comfortable in their position all right well in in acts um 18 let me see if i can find it um yes verse 6 when they opposed him and blasphemed. Notice, did Paul cringe in horror that they don't like me? No, he says, he shook his garments as if to shake off the dust. He says, you, you are still in your sins. You're impure. I, I shake off. I, I reject what your, your position. I don't accept your position because I know I'm representing God. He says, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own hands. I am clean. From now on, I go to the Gentiles. In other words, I'm moving on from you now, but I've given you the witness. I have fulfilled my responsibility. Now you're going to have to answer to God for your rejection of me. That's, that's what it's all about. All right. It's important because otherwise we'll stop witnessing just at the first sign of rejection. So this is how you overcome this opposition. And he says to them, then, assuredly I say to you, verse 11, I, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And, and that tells you there are degrees of punishment. In other words, those who rejected Jesus in his day will have a, wor will have a worse judgment than even Sodom and Gomorrah. Because the more light you receive... The more witness you receive and you still reject, that adds to the judgment that is coming upon you. Very serious. All right. So we shouldn't be afraid. In other words, if we face opposition, we shouldn't be afraid to speak about the judgment of God if they do not turn from their sin. Don't take the, take the upper hand, as it were. You know, somebody's threatening your life. 
you should still love them and say Jesus loves you but if you don't repent you're gonna have to answer to God for what you are doing right now if you kill me I pray that God will forgive you but you will have to answer to God in other words don't be cowed in fear but be bold in your witness in the face of opposition and persecution all right I'm not saying don't be loving but I'm saying be strong, be bold, be confident in the fact that you are God's representative. And if they're going to persecute you and even kill you, they are going to have to answer to God for that and be confident in that. Okay, let's move on. Verse 12. So they went out and preached that people should repent. And notice, what, what did they preach? They preached the good news of the kingdom. We know that from other verses. But the response to the good news is to repent. You see, the good news is there is a salvation for your sin. There is forgiveness for your sin. God will accept you. All right? So what is the response to that? It is to believe and to repent. Let's quickly go to Mark 1.15. Mark 1.15, that gives one of the clearer verses on what they preached it says the time is they for, this is what they preached the, this is the gospel the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god is at hand forgiveness is at hand healing is at hand deliverance is at hand salvation's at hand but repent and believe the gospel all right so there's two sides of the same coin you believe in christ but in believing in christ you repent from your life of sin you repent from trusting in yourself and you put all your trust in christ believe and repent uh, here in mark 16 it says that the response that they they preach the gospel and then they ask people to repent which is to change your mind change your mind from going your own way and put your trust in jesus change your mind about jesus primarily and and live accordingly turn around in other words turn around from unbelief to faith all right so that that's the gospel that they should repent and they cast out many demons they'd been given authority to do that and they anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them now it's only here in mark's gospel very interesting that they use the anointing of oil and, of course, in James 5.14, later, we're told in the church that we can anoint with oil. The oil represents the power of the Holy Spirit. That is sim symbolic of the power of the Holy Spirit, that when you anoint with oil, that the healing power of God will flow, and the oil represents that anointing of God. But here, obviously, Jesus gave them this as one way of healing the sick, anointing them with oil and healed them. They they Jesus gave them that his healing anointing and they laid hands on the sick and they healed them and sometimes they also anointed with oil as a symbol of God's presence that it, that it was God who was healing them not not man but God was healing them that's what the oil represents the Holy Spirit of God all right verse 14 now King Herod heard of him this is he's called king he wasn't technically a king but he was kind of a king and um, this is Herod Antipas he heard of him for his name had become well known so Jesus ministry was becoming very well known now at this is during the time when he's sending the 12 out so now his ministry is now multiplying and increasing and he says this extraordinary thing in verse 14 john the baptist is risen from the dead therefore these powers are at work in him now he's he's been a bit slow because he's consumed with lots of other stuff political issues um which we'll describe a little bit and and he he really hasn't noticed the rise of jesus but now suddenly he's he's getting to hear about all the miracles and the, and the crowds following Jesus and now he th he's thinking this is John the Baptist risen from the dead now what does this this tells us that at this stage in the story is when he actually killed John the Baptist remember John the Baptist for about a year or even a bit more has been in jail he's locked him up in the prison in Macarus meanwhile Jesus's ministry has been exploding in Galilee more and more crowds are following him and now we come 
to a, to a verse that tells us that he comes to King to, he comes to Herod's Herod um, Antipas's attention. And, and he thinks he's John the Baptist risen from the dead. In other words, he has just killed John the Baptist. And he's actually so tormented with guilt that he thinks that maybe this is John the Baptist risen from the dead, <laughs> coming back and now doing miracles, because John never did any miracles. But now he's come into the spiritual realm and now being raised from the dead. And that's why he's able to do all these miracles which is um, incredible, but it's because he is tortured with guilt. And this is all going to be explained in the story that we look at now. Um, and, and, and so this is Herod's um, killing of Jesus is, is this big event that is happening while the Twelve are out on their mission trip. And what we, what we see at the when they come back to Jesus at the end of their mission trip, they tell Jesus, you'll find this in Matthew, they tell Jesus that John has been executed. And then when Jesus hears that, he actually takes them to where he feeds the 5,000 across the lake, out of Herod Antipas' territory. So this is the point in the story where John the Baptist is executed, and it's a major turning point in the Gospels. And so again, out of Herod is thinking maybe Jesus is Herod risen from the dead, which is crazy, all right. But he is tortured by guilt, as we're going to see. Now others are saying, verse fifteen, are trying to explain Jesus. It's Elijah. In other words, the Jews expected because Elijah didn't die that Elijah's coming back before the end, and th and that is actually true. And they thought maybe Jesus is Elijah. And others said it is the prophet or one of the prophets, because there is, Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses. There, there was a future prophet who would be like a Moses, who would bring in a new covenant. Or it could be like one of the old-time prophets, like Jeremiah. He's, he's, he's one of these kind of prophets. So people had all their theories, you see. Verse 16, but when Herod heard, he said, this is John, who I beheaded. He's been raised from the dead. So Herod himself, for a time at least, is convinced that Jesus is John resurrected from the dead. He, because I'm sure he's been having nightmares over what he, what he did. Um, now, uh, John's been raised from the dead. And actually, in, I think it's in Luke's Gospel, he, it says that Herod Antipas sent messages out because he wanted to see Jesus. <laughs> he wanted to check, check out his theory. Um, but Jesus didn't take up that interview. Verse uh, 17. For Herod himself. Now this now gives us the back, the flashback and tells us the story. All right. Uh, about John's imprisonment and then execution. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Verse 18. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. Now, this is where we need to um, have a quick look at the Herod's family tree, which is quite complicated, but I've got a simplified diagram for you to look at here to understand what was going on here. Um, we're we're going to see this in a second. At the top there, hopefully you can see... Herod at the very top is Herod the Great, and he died in 1 BC. And he had a number of children, probably 10, 10 sons, I think. Anyway, three of them are shown here. One of them is Aristobulus, uh, and he is the father of Herodias here in this story, and the, who is a wicked woman. Um, another son of Herod is called Herod Philip. And another son is Herod Antipas that we've been talking about. All right. Now, to set the scene, Herod Antipas, uh, who is the governor of Galilee uh, and Perea, he married the daughter of Aretus, who was the king of the Nabataeans, the king of the Arabs. And uh, he, so he, he married th that woman. But... 
meanwhile, uh, Herodias, if you can see in the picture, Herodias married Herod Philip. Now, first of all, you can probably see there's a bit of an incest problem there to start with, all right? And this is just the tip of the iceberg. He, Herodias married Herod Philip. But Herod Antipas, who is married to the daughter of Aretas, okay, he visits Rome, where Herodias and Herod Philip are living, and he stays with them. And he falls in love with Herodias, and Herodias is a very uh, ambitious woman. She wants to keep marrying up. So when she, you know, she thinks, oh, maybe I can marry someone like Herod Antipas, then I will be more like a queen, you know. So in so Herod Antipas falls in love with Herodias, who again, as you can see, is an would be an incest incestuous relationship. But he proposes to Herodias and she says, Okay, I'll marry you as long as you divorce your wife, this daughter of Aretas. And so Herod agrees to that. And he actually divorces the daughter of Aretas. Fortunately, this daughter of Aretas hears about this and manages to escape back to her father, uh, which is, and um, then the father, as a result, will wage war against Herod Antipas, and Herod Antipas loses. So there's a big, uh, in, a, in a year or so, a big fallout from that. Uh, Herod Antipas defeats, uh, is defeated, and loses power. And Josephus says that, in fact, the people reckon this was a judgment on him for executing John the Baptist. They realized that was an unrighteous act that he did. All right, so just to stay with the family tree just to, uh, for a bit, Herod Antipas then divorces the da daughter of Aretas and marries Herodias. Now, this is absolutely against the law, against the word of God, apart from the incest involved, and apart from the fact that it was adultery. There are two scriptures that absolutely, and let's, let's, um, we'll look at these two scriptures in a minute, that absolutely say you must never marry your brother's wife, not while your brother is alive. That's absolutely forbidden. You're not allowed to marry your brother's wife. And that's exactly what he does, because Herod Philip is Herod Antipas' brother. So he's, he's not just committing adultery, he, he's actually committing a particular form of incest that is explicitly forbidden to marry your brother's wife. Okay? And uh, then um, notice another character in the family tree here is Salome, and that's Herodias's daughter, and she's the one that does the sexy dance. Okay, so we've introduced the characters of the story now. Um, uh, let us now quickly uh, go back to the scripture and look at Leviticus 18, verse 16, just to see. This is what directly led to John's execution. Leviticus 18, verse 16. And there's a similar verse as well in Leviticus 20, 21. You can check that for yourself. But let's go to Leviticus 18, verse 16. It says, You will not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. So it explicitly forbids sexual relations and marriage with your brother's wife. We well, might as well check out Leviticus 20, 21 as well. It, again it says, If a man takes his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He's uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. So, here we see it's forbidden. And that's why John the Baptist, you see, spoke out against this marriage. It was not just adulterous. It was incestuous. It was against the law. And you see, John was a true prophet because he didn't... If he's going to say... If he's going, he's calling people back from sin, back to God. Uh, he would be compromised if he didn't actually call out the ruler as well, because uh, when somebody in authority sins, it's it's more serious, because if people see the authority do this wrong, it kind of gives them permission 
to to actually sin in the same way. So it, it when the authority sins, that actually creates a whole, the whole culture of sin underneath that. So it's that's why it's particularly serious when the authority sins. So you know, John rightly, as a prophet of God, uh, denounced that. Now, the, the but the result of that is that um, Josephus describes the reason why Herod um, locked up John is because he was afraid that people followed John the Baptist so much that John might lead a rebellion against him. Um, but actually, it's the Bible says that the that the reason was. Um, and it's here again. Let's have a have a look in verse seventeen, Mark six seventeen. Um, he did it for the sake of Herodias, um, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, "You, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife." Therefore, Herodias, verse nineteen, held it against him, and and literally that is, she had it in for him. She held a grudge for him and she wouldn't let it go because he was criticizing her. And she wanted to kill him, but she could not. So Herodias was leaning hard on her husband. And and this has got reminiscence, by the way, because John came in the spirit of Elijah. This is very much like Ahab and Jezebel. All right. The uh, Herodias is like Jezebel. All right. And Ahab is the 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 weak king that Jezebel is is manipulating it's a similar situation here um he he does not want Herod doesn't want to kill John the Baptist because he knows he's a righteous man he knows he's a prophet um but he is being manipulated by his wife who is determined to kill him and it's like Jezebel was determined to kill Elijah and 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 that's why you know, Elijah fled for his life. So, uh, John stood strong. He said, it's not lawful. This is this is wrong, this marriage. Now, it fits with the political explanation, you see, because if somebody of John's stature is calling him out as, as being, as, as this is a sinful marriage, that undermines his, his right to rule. It, 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 it if the Romans hear that this Herod has lost his credibility as a ruler. They might pull the plug and they might remove him. In fact, they do later on in AD 39 because he become presumptuous. Again, because Herodias was ambitious. She, His brother, Herod Agrippa, had been called king. And so he said, we, we must go to Rome and claim kingship ourselves. And in the process, he lost, he lost his kingship. He got cast out. Um because of Herodias's ambition but um she Her Herodias being ambitious John threatened that you see John being that spokesman was a danger to her and she resented that everyone was now seeing her as the evil woman you know and um and it was also potentially threatening his right to rule um that if the Jewish people because of John's voice that would 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 start to rebel against his rule that would undermine his authority and possibly his place with Rome so the two explanations dovetail together that's why John the Baptist was arrested um, because he, he was dangerous to Herod's authority and particularly Herodias the wife wanted to kill John but, but Herod didn't want to kill John as we're going to read on now um, Herodias, verse 19, therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. Why not? For jo Herod feared John. He, Herod knew that John was, was, as it were, a man of God, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. So here's this interesting figure, Herod. He knows that there's something about John, and he's clean and he's right. And he was afraid if I kill a man like that, what kind of curse is going to come on me for doing such an evil thing? And and so that's why he didn't obey his wife <laughs> in, immediately. Um, and he actually protected John from what Herodias wanted to do to him. And when he had heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So 
here it says that he actually would go down into the prison and listen to John, and he would enjoy hearing John. As as, uh, but when it says he did many things, that's probably the wrong translation, because the better manuscript actually says that he was perplexed. He was very perplexed in many ways. He was perplexed. So, in other words, he was torn. He didn't know what to do. Because on the one hand, he's, John is dangerous to him, and his wife is nagging him every day to deal with John. But on the other hand, he, he respected John. Um, he enjoyed hearing John speak. And, and so he was perplexed. He was pulled in many different directions. He didn't know what to do. What do I do with John, you see? So his solution was just keep him locked up. And, and as far as he was concerned, that was, that was fine. But for Herodias, that was not fine. She was determined to take vengeance. She was malicious. She wanted to destroy John because he dared to criticize her and paint her as this evil woman. All right. And um, then verse 21 is the sad story. It's, um, then an opportune day came. Now, what's going on here? Opportune day. Opportune for who? Actually, it's opportune for Herodias. What is This story was not an accident. This is something Herodias planned. She knew Herod. She knew that if I can get him drunk, she knew that Herod fancied her teenage daughter from, from the other Herod Philip. And, and he would obviously leer at her. And he knew if he got her drunk, and if he actually got Salome to do this dance, he would get so stirred up that he would start making rash promises. He, she obviously knew her husband, that he was vulnerable in that area. And then she could manipulate him into killing John the Baptist. In other words, she planned this whole thing. All right, she planned this whole thing. It was an opportune day for her to get John killed. And it, it came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for his nobles, the high, office, high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And this would have been at his pa palace in Macaros, all right, on the other side of the Dead Sea, uh, one of his palaces there, and that's where John the Baptist was imprisoned. Verse 22. And now Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced. Now this, you know, for a noble woman, the daughter of, of a queen, as it were, to come in and do a dance like this, a kind of sexual dance, this, this would not happen. This would not normally happen. You might have a servant girl doing a dance, but not, a no, not somebody in the nobility. Absolutely not. Uh, even in the Gentile world, you wouldn't have that. This is something that the mother got the daughter to do as, as part of her plan. All right, this is out of the ordinary. The daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod. And obviously he fancied her anyway. And, and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, ask him whatever you, ask me whatever you want and I'll give it to you. Now, he is so aroused and no doubt intoxicated that he, he has lost all sense of rationality and reason. And now he is saying to her, and, and, and Herodias knew he would do this. He would say, I, I, he's so kind of aroused, he'd do anything. Just ask me what you want. I'll do it for you, you see. And um, he's falling into the trap. And, and he also swore to her, whatever you ask me, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. He's totally, he's totally uh, obsessed with her. And actually what this means, half, half the kingdom, basically means um, he would be willing even to make her his queen. That's what it means. In other words, as, as the queen, she would, as it were, have half the kingdom. She, in other words, he said, I'll even divorce your mother and marry you. That's how corrupt this whole thing was. All right. And, he, and, and that would be another incestuous marriage. And so he's willing to give her anything. Verse 24. So she went out and said to her mother, and obviously she was her, very much her mother's daughter, what shall I ask? 
whisper, and this is playing into Herodias's hands. She said, the head of John the Baptist. She didn't need a second to think about it. She had got this whole thing planned out. I want John's head. Immediately she came in with haste to the king. She didn't question it. She was obedient to her mother. And, uh, and she probably had the same hatred of John that her mother had. And asked, saying, I want you to give me at once. No hesitation. She knew had to strike while the iron's hot, while he's under this, under her spell, as it were. At once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So they're bringing in all these other food dishes on platters. I want John the Baptist on a platter. Gross. Verse 26, and, and immediately the king was exceedingly sorry. He didn't want to kill John the Baptist. All right. Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Technically, he could have said, oh, I made a rash promise. I didn't really mean it. And he, he could have got away with it. But so he, he but he was weak. He was morally weak. And as a result, he wanted to protect his authority. He he knew that with all the people who had heard him make this promise, if he didn't keep the promise, he would lose credibility. So because of all these unimportant people, the most important thing to him was not being moral or ethical. It was keeping his image, keeping his authority. That was the main thing. And so that leads to corruption. Okay, And so he did not want to refuse her, even though he didn't want to kill John the Baptist. He was sorry that he had to do it. So immediately, verse 27... He sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. He sent someone down to the cellars, to the dungeon, cut off John's head without any kind of trial. And he, and he, he went and he beheaded him in prison. Verse 28. And he brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. Terrible. And... Um, then it says, when his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. So his John the Baptist disciples were able to, to come and take his body. Um, one interesting thing about this, this is again, we've been talking about when the gospel is preached and when truth is told, there, there is persecution and opposition. And even in this case, it can lead to death. All right. But... Even if you have to die for your faith, God will give you a glorious resurrection. Praise God. But the interesting thing about this, and this is really my last observation, is you know, we've seen that Jesus was rejected by his own uh, at Nazareth, and that's a picture of him also being rejected by Israel, his own people. Uh, but that didn't stop him do, get, doing his mission, and God was able to work it for good and get the gospel to the Gentiles. And then we see that his disciples, too, had to learn to handle that rejection and stay on message. And if you're rejected in one place, you just carry on and share the gospel somewhere else. Shake the dust under, off your feet. And here we have the picture of when you give the word of God, you, one might have to play the ultimate price and be a martyr. But, but God, will, God will exalt you, you know, through that. The interesting thing in this is that this, there are two passion stories in Mark's gospel. That passion means death. One is the death of John the Baptist and one is the death of Jesus. And the two are parallel to each other. There's a lot of resonances for it. So in other words, when we see the, the death of John the Baptist, this is a prefigurement of the death of Jesus. And Jesus knew that. In fact, I think I just want to, to check in, in Matthew, if I've got this right. Um, yeah, Matthew 14, verse 11 says and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl and she brought it to her mother then the disciples verse 12 matthew fourteen twelve. the disciples came took away his body and buried it and went and told jesus so john's disciples came and told jesus and when jesus heard it he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself so when this happened 
Jesus went, he wanted to get away because John, he was close to John. And also John's death was a prefigurement of his own death, that he too will be killed. Okay, in the similar way. And I'll show you the parallels in a second. And so he wanted to go to a deserted place by himself, I think. If you like, to mourn John's death and, and realize that this was a new step forward in, the ti in his timetable. Because John dying now set the scene now for his death, which would be in about a year's time. And so this was a reminder to Jesus what was going to happen. And interestingly, that is when he did the miracle, which we're going to see next time. This is when he did the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And this miracle is a picture of his death. Because he says, I am the bread of life. Remember that bread that was broken in death and will be offered up to God. And in his resurrection, he will feed the world. And this is the first time, really, that Jesus, pretty much the first time, where Jesus announces his death. So John's death wasn't just something for Jesus to mourn, but it was also a reminder that he is heading towards the same kind of death, a martyr's death. Let me just point out, in, in, in closing this, the similarity. You see, what you have... Herod Antipas is a bit like Pilate. He's the, the, the weak ruler who doesn't want to kill Jesus. Herod didn't want to kill John. He, Pilate was aware that this is a righteous man, just like John. But there was this evil Herodias who was driving, the, and she is like the Jewish leaders that were driving the death of, um, you know, Driving, driving the death. So, and and then of course you you have the fact that they are they are killed for for what they they say. Jesus exposed the evil rulers for for what they were, and in the same way, John the Baptist exposed Herodias for her evil, and that caused them to want to to kill him. And and then, of course, he is killed and. Again, we see that his disciples are the ones who bury his body. And and so it's there's just an interesting correspondence there that John the Baptist's death is given a lot of time in the in the scripture, much more in Mark than his ministry even, because it is a fore, foretelling of Jesus' own death at the hands of of, of a weak of a weak ruler who is being pressured by this evil, the, these evil Jezebels, as it were. All right, praise God. So let's go back to Mark 6 and just get, read the final verse. Um, we've, we've seen the story of John's death. And verse 30, the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all the things from their mission trip, both what they had done and what they had taught. They reported back. And at the same time, Jesus heard the news, as we heard from Matthew, about John the Baptist's death. And that's when we're going to see next time they go across across the lake to, to Bethsaida. And Bethsaida is outside the territory of Herod Antipas. So, do you remember, just tie this one last thing together, do you, do you remember, I, well, it's in one of the other Gospels, I think it's in Luke's Gospel, that Herod Antipas thinks that Jesus is John risen from the dead, and he wants to see him. He, he wants to get hold of Jesus, because he's afraid that Jesus is John risen from the dead. So, no wonder Jesus doesn't want that meeting yet <laughs> that would be too dangerous jesus therefore leaves the territory of herod antipas let's let's just bring up that picture one last time the picture the map that we saw earlier on um and we'll and we'll see what happens next just to point out the next thing jesus you know was wise sometimes you know if you're if you're rejected in one place and and they're you know he says be wise as a serpent harmless as a dove move on 
move on and witness somewhere else. You know, and Jesus was in danger from Herod Antipas. But notice when he crossed the lake, he went into the area called Batanea. All right. Do you see where um, the, the, top, the top of the Lake of Galilee, just on the other side of the Jordan in Batanea, is where Bethsaida is? And it's outside the territory of Herod Antipas. It's in the territory of Philip, the Tetrarch. So he was safe from Antipas there. And that's one reason why he went across into, into Philip's territory. Because, again, what do you do when you're persecuted? You don't stop doing God's work. You, you may sometimes need to get out of the reach of those who are trying to, to kill you. That's just common sense. But you just keep on doing God's work and uh, you, you, you just get led by the Holy Spirit and if you move on from someone because they've rejected you don't let it spoil your life don't let it you know don't take the don't take that rejection on yourself just shake off the dust off under your feet and move on to the next thing that God has for you don't be intimidated and don't receive that the negativity on yourself just be satisfied you have done your part now you're leaving it in God's hands and if they don't repent, they'll have to answer to God for that. You need to have that kind of confidence. So again, when persecution, when opposition comes, just keep doing the will of God, and, and God will be with you. And uh, even if it leads to martyrdom, even that is the, the gate to glory. Well, God bless you. Um, I hope that uh, that's opened a few, few doors of uh, understanding for you. God bless you. Amen.